Hey, this is Jack Ryan here from the Legal and Liability Risk Management Institute. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, an issue that's really um, a, a major issue in law enforcement this week, what's going on in Minneapolis. I don't want to talk specifically about Minneapolis, but I do want to talk about care, custody, control, and restraint of prisoners and use that as a backdrop uh, for that uh, to, to put out some reminders. Um, Again, I, I don't know that we even have to do this. I think most officers that I'm talking to looking at the video recognize that there's some major issues in, in what occurred in that case. Uh, officers have been openly critical, uh, both across the internet, social media sites that I, uh, I see. <clears throat> and I thought we should address it as a uh, training uh, practices and policy event. Um, take some of the um, emotional issues out of it. Again, not to say that there's not emotional issues or emotional issues that aren't justified, but take some emotional issues out of it uh, to uh, look at it in a light uh, that, that reflects upon what law enforcement really looks like as opposed to what we at least at this point see in the video. So again, when we're talking about care, custody, control, and restraint of prisoners, it always has to be recognized that anytime we take custody of somebody, we now owe them a duty of care uh, in addition to uh, taking custody of them. So that duty of care runs to injuries, it runs to illnesses, it runs to manner of restraint, and it runs to, you know, uh, making sure uh, that they're not in physical distress uh, at, at some level. I will tell you that this is not uh, Minneapolis's first case like this. They had another case, the David Smith case. Uh, that goes back a few years. Some of you in class have heard me talk about it. It was the one at the YMCA. Um, I'll tell you, a great civil rights attorney, uh, Bob Bennett, uh, was, uh, was the person who uh, represented the family in that case. And, and part of the settlement in that case, uh, at least my understanding, was that it involved some retraining of members of the Minneapolis Police Department. So, so I, I think, you know, that's going to be something that, that gets looked at in this case, I would say. Here's, here's the bottom line, and, and you know, I used to say this in, in training for years and years and years, and I continue to say it. I don't know that I say it the same way, but I used to say we ought to have stamped uh, maybe a tattoo on the back of our hand, maybe stamped in the, in the dashboard of the, the police vehicle, that as soon as the person is subdued or restrained, then get off them and get them into a rescue position. Get them into an upright position or on their side to facilitate breathing. There's all kinds of arguments in the medical field about prone restraint and what degree that cuts off oxygen and all these kinds of things. But we have to recognize that irrespective of the prone restraint uh, and whether you go with those arguments that it does cut down oxygen or not, even those that say it doesn't cut down oxygen will say that prolonged prone restraint, particularly with pressure on the back for a prolonged period of time, may lead to you know more serious consequences so even even those that cut against that so I, I think that's important to mention the fact of the matter is law enforcement ought to stay out of those debates and it, it ought to be a simple proposition and you know you've probably all got this in policy you probably all had this in training that as soon as the person's restrained get off them get them into a position that facilitates breathing some agencies call it the rescue position and so we see that issue the other thing is, and I will tell you there's case law on this, um, there's been case law that's been critical anytime an officer puts their knee and their body weight on somebody's neck. Uh, there are cases where it is alleged that the person uh, suffers serious injury as a result of, of the knee being on the neck. So again, you know, um, when I look at the video, and again, I'm, I'm, try I'm not making any judgments one way or the other, other than to say that everything I saw violated training and policy as I see it. Um, as I look at the video, uh, you know, you have to criticize the placement of the officer's weight through his knee on the person's neck. I don't know of any department that trains that, um, and I don't know of any department that uses that technique, and, and quite frankly, I, I would be critical of a department that does. Um, so you've got, you've got that issue, uh, the placement of the weight on the neck. One of the things, you know, when we need to stabilize somebody with body weight to accomplish handcuffing, uh, shoulder, hips, uh, those areas, 
but not the middle of the back or the neck. We've always been, uh, you know, uh, discouraged in training from doing that. Now, I, I recognize that sometimes things happen in the midst of a fight, uh, and there's a lot of movement, and there may be times where you're briefly in a bad position, but, but there's no excuse for remaining in that position for a long period of time. It's, it's really that simple. Um, the other issue that we see come up in, in cases like this one in Minneapolis, and, and again, not judging whether the actions are criminal, not judging whether there's a, a racial component to this. We, let's just stick to the police stuff for a minute, the law enforcement stuff. And we have to say that if an officer sees uh, conduct that would be injurious or that would be excessive force, then the officer has a duty to intervene. So while there are a couple of, um, in, the, in, the, in this instance, there's at least a couple of officers, there's an, an additional officer, at least one more that I see in the video uh, on Mr. Floyd, or at least down uh, by his legs. Um, the other officers that are around also have a duty to intervene and to take action, uh, particularly when they see uh, what is obvious excessive force. And excessive, whether it's malicious or not, it's, it's still excessive when you, when you stay on top of somebody for eight minutes with your knee on their neck. Um, uh, nobody can say that that's a reasonable restraint. And as I said, I've been, I've been watching the internet the last couple of days, uh, even the police uh, blogs and websites are, are being critical of what occurred there and, 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 um, and recognize that it, it was not appropriate. So again, I guess there's some takes out of this, and this is the message that I guess I wanted to get forth uh, to folks that follow our law enforcement training, is that we have an obligation for care, custody, control, and restraint of prisoners. That obligation runs to the manner of restraint. So restraint in a prone position for a long period of time with weight on the subject is not going to be consistent with generally accepted policies, practices, training, and even legal mandates with respect to use of force. You know, in a case like this, we also have to look at the fact that the crime is minor. Remember, the Graham three-part test applies to this case. How serious was the offense? What was the physical threat that the subject uh, created and continued at the time the force was used? And whether there was active resistance or an attempt to evade arrest by flight? Now the video of, of Mr. Floyd coming out of the car has come out and we see that he's restrained and handcuffed before he's on the ground. Now we don't know what happens between that surveillance video and the bystanders video. We don't know if there was some pull away or some resistance. We don't know that. Uh, but the point being is he's on the ground, he's restrained. There's three to four officers there. Uh, we have one officer who's, who's basically standing around, so that would indicate a lack of uh, active resistance. So there's a lot of indicators in this case. But how serious was the offense? It was alleged forgery with a phony $20 bill is what's being reported. Uh, what was the physical threat? There's very little physical threat when he's handcuffed with officers on top of him controlling him. Uh, and then was there active resistance? There is not active resistance in the first video, the surveillance video. Um, there's certainly not active resistance in the bystander video to the extent that we're able to see it. Um, and is he a physical threat? Well, he's restrained with his hands behind his back. Uh, he's got two officers on him. Uh, and, and at the time, there's at least one other officer standing around. Uh, yeah, maybe doing a little bit of crowd control, but it, it, in some portions, just kind of standing around watching. So again, it, it really begs the question of whether or not this could, could ever be a constitutional use of force. Hey, bottom line, um, duty to uh, take care, custody, control of prisoners, uh, proper restraint of prisoners, and prone custody restraint is recognized by law enforcement as being dangerous. Once you get the restraint accomplished, we got to get them off them quickly. And we've got to make sure that we get them in a position that facilitates breathing uh, and placement of any body weight uh, should not be placed on somebody's neck or the center of their back, anything that could impair breathing. And again, recognizing the arguments that of whether or not it cuts oxygen or not. Hey, thank you again for joining us. Please be safe out there and have a great day.